Colossians chapter 3 is where we're going to go this morning. Good morning to you. So glad to be here with you today. I really do feel like I'm among friends. I always love it when uh, the, the highways lead back to Community Baptist Church down here. I love it. I love coming down. Uh, we've been up at it. We left the house at 7. Okay, no, we didn't. We tried to leave the house at 7. <laughs> We're a typical family. If you ever wondered if there's anything, uh, you know, about preachers who just everything goes well for every... No, we actually had one of those mornings. We couldn't get out the door. Uh, things weren't going quite right. Got a little stressful. The dog even threw up. Uh, right as we're getting ready to go out. So even the dog wanted to be a part of everything. And, but you know what? We love being here, and my heart has been refreshed already by the music. I just, I just appreciate uh, being able to sing together with believers who believe the same thing. And that's really what it's about. I appreciate what Brother Daniel had to say, because really that's what we're doing here. We're, we're together. This is where we come to worship. This is where we come to be a family. We've, we've spent the week in the world and this is where we come together to be with each other, with people who are like-minded. And so it's really been a blessing already to be with you this morning. Uh, as Pastor mentioned, I, I, I get to work for the Wilds of New England Christian Camp. How many of you have ever heard of the Wilds of New England? Figured most of you had. How many of you have ever been there? All right, great. Well, we welcome all of you. We just finished summer camp. And quite honestly, I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> I, I love summer camp. And I don't, I don't get to work with the campers quite as much. I get to work with staff more than campers, and uh, some of whom are in the, in the room. And we just had, we had a fantastic staff, just wonderful staff. Micah was in the kitchen, and I uh, just loved having Micah in the kitchen. And got to see a lot of the campers from here, just sometimes multiple times coming from here. And some of the Browns, they, I think they get the most frequent flyer miles uh, back and forth to camp uh, this summer. And we just really enjoyed it. God, God did a great thing. We saw kids confess sin this summer and take steps towards Christ's likeness. Some confessed Christ for the first time, receiving Christ uh, as their Savior. Man, it was exciting. Uh, Drew was a counselor this summer. I remember he telling me about uh, he got two of his campers to receive Christ. He got to watch God do that right in front of him. And it was just so cool to see God do this multiple times with many counselors. And uh, then to see some just uh, confessing sin and sanctification, growing in their relationship with Christ. And it's not anything special about us. It's just God, God doing his work. And uh, we just happen to be those that get a, the privilege of, of having a front row seat, of watching God do something great in the lives of people. So thank you for your support. I know many of you prayed for us. You support us. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of all the campers who were impacted for Christ this summer. Thank you for your investment in what we do. And uh, so we got a couple days off here. And uh, great, I get to spend time with some of my favorite people in the world, my children and my wife. I get to do that. And it's a privilege to be able to be down here with you. Uh, this is, I can't think of a better way to start my vacation than spending time with you, being able to share God's word with you. And then we're going to jump right back into our fall camps. This weekend we have our... Our upcoming weekend, we have our young adults retreat, and if you consider yourself to be a young adult, you are invited, <laughs> okay? I'm not going to put an age limit on that, but if you consider yourself to be a young adult, we'd love to have you come. We've got a golf tournament coming up. Uh, Brother Daniel said he was going to try to come. I've seen him golf. <laughs> he probably needs help, so if you feel like being a blessing and administering to him, just come along with him and uh, come to our golf tournament. All the proceeds to our golf tournament go to our scholarship fund uh, uh, for campers who cannot afford to come to camp. And so all that money goes into getting more campers into camp who couldn't afford to come otherwise. And uh, so then we have couples retreat, ladies retreat, men's retreat, all kinds of things happening at camp this fall. So we invite you to make your way up to camp. And I know several of you probably will. And we look forward to seeing you there. But now what's really important is that we dive into God's Word. I appreciated uh, what Daniel's already said this morning about perspective. Sometimes we have the wrong perspective. And this morning we're going to talk about perspective. And when we talk about perspective, you've got to know what perspective is. And of course, for me, I always have to start with the dictionary. And sometimes it doesn't really help me a whole lot. But the dictionary says that perspective is the, are you ready for this, the capacity to view things in their true relations or their relative importance. That just means, boiled down layman terms, it's how we look at things. I have found throughout my, my, uh, my marriage that men and women 
have different perspectives. We look at things very different. You ever go to like to a wedding reception and they have all these little things, they call them sandwiches. They're, they're about a half inch by half inch and they got like something like chicken salad or something on there and they got all these little dainty little fluffy little things and they, they call them pigs in a blanket, you know, a little, little piece of meat with a little, and my wife is going like this, this is exactly what she does. Ooh, she's so excited about going to this. And I'm thinking, I need like 20 of those little pigs in a blanket before we even get started. I mean, we're talking appetizers here. Our perspective on, on, on going to wedding receptions are very different. <laughs> I'm probably more interested in the cake than I am those little tiny salads or little sandwiches things. I find that there are a lot of things that my wife and I see very differently. There are people who view history very different. I, I've spent 20 years in the South. I grew up in northern Illinois, the land of Lincoln. And I moved to the South. I found out that I was the one who had an accent. <laughs> I also found out that the Civil War is not over. Did you know that? You probably don't realize that, but you go down South. I don't think it's over yet down there. Their perspective on the Civil War is very different than what I grew up with as a perspective of the Civil War. I know that this is a military church. There's a, many of you involved in the local military here. And the, the perspective of war and fighting and, and those kind of things is very different for you soldiers than it is for us civilians. We don't, we don't get it like you get it. So perspective is just how you view things. Well, today we need to have what I would call the eternal perspective. The eternal perspective. The eternal perspective is, and I'll try to say this so that you can catch this, it's understanding God's view of eternity with the goal of influencing our, our current view of our present. Let me say it again. The eternal perspective is understanding God's view of eternity with a view of influencing our current view of our present. Does that make sense? Because God's view and our view don't match. Our view and God's view don't, don't, don't relate. God's view of what the big picture of eternity is very different than our view of our current present. God sees this immense picture we see this little bit. I'm reminded of, of the times that um, we had the privilege of, of being in Colorado at the Wilds of the Rockies for, for about five, six years. And in so doing, we got to drive through some of the most incredible landscape known to man. Rocky Mountain National Park, 14,000 uh, foot peaks and snow cap and you're driving down the road in this park and there's there's elk crossing the road in front of you and there's and there's bear and there's there's mountain goats and there's these incredible views and and I, I remember thinking I've, I've got a child in the back seat in a, in a car seat now I know that can mean about anything I, our, I felt like our kids weren't going to get out of their car seat until they were six foot five and 270 pounds but I never thought I'd get out of car seats. But I remember our kids being in car seats with little, little toddlers. We're driving through these incredible mountains and the views, and Renee and I are just like, wow, check that out and check that out. And our view was incredible. And you know, I've got a, a two-year-old Drew in the back seat, and he's looking out the window. He could care less. He wants more Cheerios. And sometimes we're, we're like that. We get our focus on Cheerios. What's right here in front of us. And we're missing what's outside the window. This immense view, this immense impact of, of amazing what God has created. And yet sometimes we're more focused on Cheerios. Now, I'm not faulting a toddler. That's, that's, that's all they can really understand. But for us, God wants us to look out the window a little bit. Put down the Cheerios, so to speak, and to take in the real reality of where we are. And so today I want to talk about perspective. And this is a challenge because the world, the flesh and the devil, you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to get us to ignore God's reality, to ignore God's perspective. And, you know, you only live once. YOLO, I mean, you only live once, so just go out and enjoy life. And God's saying, no, there's, there's, there's a bigger picture going on here. 
So with that in mind, we're going to go to Colossians chapter number 3, and we're going to try to get a little bit of God's view of eternity, God's perspective. Colossians 3, verse 1, if ye then, the actual idea there is since, since then you are risen with Christ. He's referring back to chapter 2 where he mentioned that we have been risen with Christ. That means that there was a death that happened. And as just as Christ was raised from the dead, we have been raised to the newness of life, Romans chapter 6. So there's been, a, there's been a death, and we all had to die to ourselves before we received Christ. We had to die to our wants. We had to die to our desires to sin. We had to die to that. And with that became the resurrection of new life. Now, this body hasn't been resurrected yet, but there's coming a day when that's going to happen if we are true believers. So he's saying, since you are risen with Christ... Seek, the idea is search for those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And set your affection, meaning put your mind on, think about things above, not about things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Where is this whole thing going? Glory. What are we referring to? Heaven. This is where it's going. He says, if you have been saved, if you have been risen with Christ, then search for and think about things that matter most in heaven because you're going there. Get your eyes off Cheerios and start looking out the window and seeing the big picture of what's really going on. Now, to help us understand what is really going on, let's flip over to Isaiah chapter number 6. Here in Isaiah chapter number 6, we get, a, we get a view of God. We get a view of God that Isaiah got. Some people would call this a vision. I really think that God somehow let him see into, whether you want to call it a vision or not, Isaiah got to see something. And Jesus actually validated this in, in John 12. He said that Isaiah saw Jesus in his glory. And he's referring back very specifically to this chapter of Scripture. And so this is a real event. This actually happened. Isaiah got to see something. Isaiah 6, verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Isaiah saw this, God, Jesus, sitting on a throne. He was high and lifted up. Now, what does that mean? Was he just like floating in the air? We don't quite know. No one quite understands, but I know one thing. He was seat seated on a throne, and that throne was exalted. This is an amazing picture of Jesus on his throne. And the Bible says here, and his train filled the temple. Now, we don't always use the term train. We're not talking about locomotives, okay? We're talking about the train of his robes. The longer the train of the robe, the more majesty, the more power a king was known to have. And how much power does this king have? Well, his entire train filled the temple. I don't really quite understand what that means. Must have been a lot of material, a lot of cloth floating around. I don't really know. But I know one thing. This was an amazing sight as Jesus sits on his throne. And his, his robes, his majesty fills the entire temple. But that's not all. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with the other two he did fly. And one cried to another. And by the way, seraphim... That word means fiery one. Now try to get this picture. You have Jesus on his throne. It's high, it's lifted up. His train is filling the temple. And then there's these beings, these fiery ones. And they got six wings. And they're hovering around the throne. And here's what they do. They cry one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. In Hebrew, anytime you repeat something three times, it, it emphasizes it almost like indefinitely. Unlimited holiness to our God. Unlimited. God is above everything. He is not limited by anything. He is unlike anything we know. 
holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. The whole earth is full of his glory. I, if I was Isaiah, I wouldn't know what to do with this. He didn't either. But it got, it got, even, it got even worse for him. And the, the post of the door moved, shook with the voice of them that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. The idea of the smoke there is like a cloud, like the Shekinah glory that filled the temple when Solomon built it. The kind of glory that, that led the Israelites by day. Amazing picture. But my friends, please don't miss this. This is what's happening right now. This, isn't a, this wasn't some kind of make-believe thing that kind of happened for a few seconds. As you sit here today, the seraphim are around our Lord declaring his holiness. This awesome, impressive picture is what you might call everyday life in heaven. Search for and think about things that matter most in that picture. Far risen Savior on his throne, high lifted up, his train fills the temple, it's filled with smoke, it cannot handle his presence. And the seraphim, they don't even know what to do. They just keep crying, holy, holy is the Lord God. Maybe today you could help me out. Let's just think about a few things that don't matter. What are some things that don't matter in the presence of God? Can you think of something that doesn't really matter in the presence of God? Someone just tell me something. Money. Jesus isn't sitting on his throne going, how am I going to help Steve down there? Something else that doesn't really matter. Fame. <laughs> My reputation is not of great concern in that present moment. There's only one person's reputation that really matters, and he's sitting on the throne. What's another one? Will the roast be overcooked? <laughs> Amen, brother. As a human man, I'm relating with you. And so that might have been a backdoor message for me to keep this thing moving. I'm not sure, but. <laughs> What's for dinner doesn't really matter in the presence of God. What else? I heard something else. Power. Our position. Can I, can I just say something very carefully? Maybe I should stand behind you in case you start throwing things. The NFL doesn't really matter in the presence of God. Now, I love football. I love watching sports. But you know, it doesn't really matter in the presence of God. What are you so concerned about? What grabs your attention? Does it even matter in the presence of God? What does matter in the presence of God? His majesty, his holiness, his people. You know, it's been said that really the only thing we take to heaven with us is other people. It would seem that we would think about and search for things that help other people stand rightly in the presence of God. Do you know what? I'm... I, don't, I didn't want to preach this message this morning. You know why? Because I got Cheerios in my hands. And I find myself so easily distracted by the Cheerios that I lose sight of what's really important. The eternal perspective is understanding God's view of eternity with the, influ with the goal of influencing my current view of my present. My friends... Are you distracted by your Cheerios this morning? God wants us to have an eternal perspective. You know, Isaiah got it. His response was, whoa, I don't belong here. This thing is not about me. Woe is me, I am, a, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And God said, great, now I can use you to magnify me and bring other people to an understanding of my holiness. 
That ought to be our response too. Remember, Paul said, if you're risen, remember that you have already died because someday you're going to be with him in glory. We're going there. This is the end game. This is where it's all going to go. But we get stuck looking at our Cheerios and we're upset when our Cheerios run out or we're upset when our Cheerios get spilt. And God's saying, would you just look out the window? Can't you see the enormity of what I am and who I am? I want to I take the microscope and, and turn a little, bit, a little bit deeper yet. And by, by going to, to Psalm 90, would you go to Psalm 90 with me? I, I want us to just take a quick look at this psalm, because this psalm is the oldest psalm that we know of. It was written by Moses. I think most of you recognize the man Moses. And there's really no time frame given to this particular psalm, but we believe that this psalm is written towards the end of this 40-year journey that they took in the wilderness. There are references that kind of lead us to this thought that he's looking at 40 years in the wilderness. And we know that the 40 years of wilderness was, was there because of the unbelief of the people. It's, hard, it's, it's actually really hard for us to, to comprehend about two and a half million people wandering through a wilderness. And there was a whole generation that was supposed to die off before they could enter the promised land. And what's astounding to me is if you really start doing the math about that many people and passing 40 years, there is an average of at least 200 funerals a day, I believe, or more. Funeral services were very commonplace in the wilderness. We don't normally think about that, but this is what Moses is thinking about. He's thinking about wandering, there's, they have no home, and there's funerals every time they turn around. So in verse number one, he's going to introduce us to the concept of who God is. Sometimes to get the best picture of something, to get the best understanding of something, you have to understand it's opposite. So he's going to make a very stark contrast in this psalm. Remember, a bunch of wandering people, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place. We don't have a home on this earth, so God, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Now, Moses wasn't that old. If you start doing the history and the study of how old the earth is, how long Adam lived, about a thousand years. Moses isn't very far removed from this generation. He's not, he, he understands that he's, he's not that old. He has seen a lot. But God, Lord, the word is Adonai, Master, You've been our dwelling place. You've been our security through all the generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the idea of birth is in mind here, before the mountains were ever born, wherever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. El is the name he uses there. You are the mighty one. From everlasting to everlasting. You know, he's trying to paint this picture that God is awesome, and God is eternal. There's nothing temporary about our God. From everlasting to everlasting, how do you describe everlasting to everlasting? Taxes, maybe, you know, my diapers, for those of you who are in that stage. They, for me, it was car seats. You know, that just seemed like eternal. But there's really nothing on our earth that can really paint the picture from everlasting to everlasting. A self-existing God. He's been our dwelling place. Oh, he's going to turn the picture to help us understand just how fragile you and I are. Verse 3, thou turnest man to destruction. The idea of destruction is to pulverize into dust. Your mind might flip back to Genesis chapter 3, I believe it is. From dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. This is the idea. You know, God can pulverize us into dust. I mean, we came from the dust, and we're going to go back to dust, and God can pulverize us at any moment. Does that make you feel real manly this morning? Does this make you feel like you're worth a lot when you recognize that you were made from dust and you're going back to dust? It doesn't help me with my self-image, okay? 
God says, you're just dust. Verse 4, for a thousand years in thy sight, they're but yesterday when it's past. A thousand years, and we think, wow, a thousand years. We don't even, you know, most of the time, we don't see many of us making it to a hundred. But Moses has in mind a lot of people. He's got like Adam, who lived close to a thousand years, and uh, a, a lot of the other patriarchs lived really long lives. So a thousand years, a lifetime to him. A whole lifetime. And how does he describe it? <laughs> That's yesterday. It used to be a common saying. That's so yesterday. You guys remember that saying? That's so yesterday. Yeah, okay, come on, get, get with it. That's like, I mean, that's like, and, and, and Moses is saying that it's a thousand years is just like yesterday. It's gone. He goes on to say that they are as a watch in the night. The Hebrew watch, there was three Hebrew watches in the night, about four hours apiece. A thousand years is just like a four-hour shift. Some of you work the shift work. A four-hour shift. A thousand years. Gone. In God's sight, what's a thousand years? Our life is very short. Verse 5, thou carest them away as, as with a flood. A thousand years disappear like in a flood. Have you ever been by a flood? How many of you have ever stood on the banks of a flooding river? At the wilds in North Carolina, I got to serve there for about 20 years. We, we would get, frequently get floods. And I just love to go stand and watch the water ripping by and, you know, branches are going by and leaves are going by. And, you know, you, you're, you're just, for me, I'm always tempted to jump in. <laughs> I don't know why. It's like, I don't know, weirdness inside of me. I just want to jump in there and see what it will do to me. One of my favorite things with my kids was to go down to the waterfalls we had there. And uh, these big waterfalls, we had one that was 125 feet, and we had some that were 40 feet. You know, we'd, we would play in the waterfalls, and when the waterfalls came down, they would go through this little cascades things, you know, a lot of rippling water, white water. And so they had these things called rhododendrons. And, and rhododendron leaves are about this long, and they look like little banana boats, you know? And uh, we would, we would me, and my, me and the kids, we would grab a bunch of these uh, rhododendron leaves, and we'd have races. We'd stand in this water, and we would, one, two, three, go, and we'd drop these things in, and we'd have little races to see whose rhododendron leaf could, could get. And that is the, that's the concept that he's talking about. A thousand years is like just dropping that thing in, and it's gone. I never saw the leaf again. A thousand years. A lifetime is just gone like a flood. But wait, there's more. <laughs> they are as asleep. A thousand years like a sleep. You ever have those times when you go to bed, you're so exhausted, you set your alarm, you hit the pillow, and it seems like instantly the alarm's going off. You ever had that happen? Like, didn't I, didn't I, didn't I just lay down? And God says, that's how your life is. It's just gone. It's fast. It's fleeting. It's like a sleep. They are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes. It grows up, and in the evening, it's cut down, and it withers. You ever mow your lawn? <laughs> Doesn't it seem like in the springtime around here in New England? I mean, it's just like all the rains and <laughs> snows and everything else that come through, and your, your grass just grows. like over, It seems like overnight. You know, It's like every morning, you're, you're, you're having to mow your lawn. And here's this grass. It grows up, looks all nice, and then you come through and you cut it. What happens to those little blades of grass? They're gone. They wither. They're gone. And God uses that to describe your life. You grow up, you look real good, and then you get cut down and you're gone. A lifetime described as a piece of grass. He goes on to explain in uh, verse 9, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We our years as a tale that is told. You, ever, you like to tell stories? Some of you are good storytellers. I used to make up stories for my kids about Scotty the skunk. And, and I would make them up on the fly, usually at nighttime, trying to get them calmed down and go to bed. And I would make up Scotty the skunk stories. And some of them were good. Even to me, I thought they were good. And my kids would say, Daddy, tell us that one again. Uh-uh. I made it up. I couldn't tell you that story again. It was one and done. It was a five-minute story. It's gone. I can't even do it again. And God uses that to describe our lives. They're a tale that's been told. Once it's done, it's over. It's gone. The, the tale's over. But
But he does give us a hint. He says here, our our days are passed away in thy wrath. Do you know our days are being passed away in God's wrath? Ever since the curse in Genesis 3, God's wrath has been on this planet. God has had to curse. And that's why there's there's, uh, the the groundsman cursed. And and, uh, you ladies have had the, the travail of birth. And there's all kinds of things going on. And this is just God's wrath at sin upon our earth. And you and I, whether we like it or not, we are subject to God's wrath on this earth. And our days are passed away day after day after day. We endure the consequences of somebody else's choices. And we endure the, our very own consequences as well. And that's what's happening. So where does this all lead to? What is Moses' response to this frailty of life? There's just nothing really uh, satisfying, shall we say, in this psalm about our lives. We're just very frail, temporary. Our lives are so short. So Moses' conclusion is in verse 12. So teach us to number our days. God, when we get the right perspective of what's going on in eternity and the right perspective of just how short our lives really are, the answer is, God, I got this much. (laughs) I better know how to handle the days I've got. The word teach is in the imperative. Moses dares to command God, "Help help me to learn this. I need to know how to handle my life. I need to know how to count my days how to know how short my days are. The idea of of reconciling, to take careful track of. God, help me to count out my days. How many of you have a birthday? (laughs) Okay, I'm just seeing if you're awake with me. (laughs) Some of you are like, I don't know if I do or not. It's been a long week for you, I understand. All of us have birthdays. But you know, on your birth certificate, you'll notice that there is not a death date. But do you have a death date? And we don't like to think about that, do we? It's not included on your birth certificate. But technically, on your birth certificate, there is an expiration date. There is a used best by date on your birth certificate. As much as we don't like to think about it, unless Christ returns in the rapture, all of us have a death date. And that means from the day you were born, you started counting down the days. And every day we live, we have one last day. You say, Steve, you're being morbid. No, I'm being real. Because the real perspective is there's something going on in heaven. And we need to think about and search for things that matter most in God's presence. And I am concerned that we, that me, we get, we get all about the Cheerios. And I'm running out of days. I don't know how many days I've got left. But every day I live, I've got one less. That much I do know. And every day you live, you've got one less. I don't know how many days you've got. I don't know how many days I've got. So you know what? God, teach me to number my days. Teach me to treat as very valuable every single day I've got. Teach me, God, how to, as he says here, apply my heart to wisdom. How to harvest is actually the word there. How to harvest wisdom. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to see life from God's perspective. God, I need wisdom. I'm running out of days. I don't have time to get sidetracked by things that don't matter in your presence. I've got to be focused on what really matters on this earth in your presence. I'm candid with you today when I tell you that I'm very tempted to stare at my bowl of Cheerios. And I miss the big perspective of eternity. And may I say, I work for a, I work for a Christian ministry. I try to serve people every day of my life. And I'm guilty of staring at the Cheerios. We need to have an eternal perspective. 
We have to ask God to help us understand the brevity of our life and help us to number our days. What do you live for? What does it look like to number our days? It's possible that I'm talking to someone this morning that you've, you're not a believer yet. You've never come to Christ. You've never had your sins forgiven. You've not been introduced to Jesus as your Savior, who, the one who will deliver you from the consequences and punishments that are coming your way because of sin. And Jesus died on a cross, and he rose again to conquer death so that you don't have to die eternally. He died so that you could have life. And it's possible there's somebody here in this room, I'm begging you to receive Christ as your Savior because you're running out of days. You can't say, well, I'm going to save that for another day. You don't know how many days you have. And it's possible that I'm looking at someone that you, you look like a Christian, you act like a Christian, you smell like a Christian, you do everything like a Christian, but you know you're not. I am your friend this morning, and I'm begging you, don't play games with God. You're running out of days, and you're going to stand at that awesome site and meet Jesus, not as your Savior, but as your judge. And I'm begging you, don't, don't do that. It's possible that there's some Christians here this morning, you, you're staring at your Cheerios, and you be, might be like that toddler in the back seat who's screaming because you lost all your Cheerios or your Cheerios are all gone. And you're all upset with God about things that have happened in your life. And I'm not saying that life is easy. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about we miss the big picture of what God is trying to do with our lives. And life is tough on this planet because this planet is under the wrath of God. So I'm not minimizing your struggle. But I am saying that oftentimes we get our eyes on the struggle instead of the Savior. And we're running out of days. And we don't have time to be kicking, kicking the ground and, and complaining against God when there's work to be done to magnify our wonderful, holy God. I wonder if you're a Christian this morning and you have, you've left your first love. You haven't just lost it, you left it. There may be sin in your life. There may be just complete distractions. Things that really don't matter in the presence of God. You're staring at Cheerios. What's your attitude towards God today? I'm not saying everyone in the room is a wicked sinner, even though we are. I'm not saying that all of you have turned your back on God. I'm asking you to do some self-evaluation. Where are you with God today? Are you living with the eternal perspective? God's view of eternity, it should influence our current view of our present reality. We need to get the eyes off what seems temporal and make sure we're viewing everything through the eternal perspective of what's going on in heaven. Because what's happening here on this earth is very temporal. It's very fleeting. And woe to us if we give all of our attention, all of our efforts, all of our resources for something that doesn't matter for eternity. Where are you this morning? Do you have the eternal perspective? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? I'm I'm finished preaching, but I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I'm going to turn it over to Pastor to conclude the service as he seems fit. But how many of you would say today, Steve, that's me. I am struggling. I, uh, I'm struggling with an eternal perspective. I've got my eyes on the Cheerios in some way. Would you pray for me? God's spoken in my heart. There's some things that need to change in my life, and I know it. Would you pray for me? Anybody like that? You just lift your hand up. I'm going to pray for you. My hand is up. Anybody else? Pray for me, Steve. I, I'm distracted. 
All right, thank you. You've been really honest. Thank you. Is there anybody in this room who'd say, Steve, I'm, I'm concerned about my eternal state? Thank you. I already see that hand. We've got one that's concerned about whether or not they're going to heaven. Thank you. Is there anybody else? You say, Steve, I'm not sure I'm saved. Thank you. I've seen, seen a couple hands, three hands. Anybody else? You say, Steve, I'm, I'm just not, not sure. Well, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to encourage you to find someone at, in this church body. Because I know there are people who will be willing to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Now, God, you have seen every hand today. I know you have. Because you're an, you're an, you're an omnipresent God. You're always with us. And quite honestly, Father, I know that I, I struggle staring at my Cheerios and I don't see the big picture sometimes. And I pray that you would help us. I pray for all those who raised their hand this morning. Help us to know the changes that need to be made. To get our eyes off our very fleeting, fragile life. And put our energies and our resources into things that matter most in your presence. For those that lifted their hands, I pray you'd help them to have answers from your word. May they dig into your word because you gave them answers there. I pray that if they need to confess and forsake sin in their life, that they'll do that this morning. Not put it off. And then I, I pray for my, my friends here who have lifted their hand. They're not sure about their salvation. And nothing would bring more glory to you. Nothing would make you smile any greater than when a sinner repents of their sin and puts their faith and their trust in you. And I pray today that you bring clarity to their mind, that the Holy Spirit will draw them to yourself, help them to understand your word. I pray that they'd be saved today. Jesus, we do love you. We somewhat dread that moment of being in your presence in that awesome sight, but at the same time, we look forward to it to seeing the one who died for us and loved us so much. Help us to live our lives for you. We ask this in your name. Amen, Pastor.